Yes, Mr. Good morning, lady. Uh, I appear in this appeal with Malone Jr. and Mr. DeBarry for the appellant claimant. Mr. Lim, Queen's Counsel, and Mr. Lyons, who, like my junior, appear below, appear for the respondent defendant. Lady, can I just check the bundles only because I know that there's been some updating with references of the skeletons in particular, and I hope that those, both on both sides, and I hope that those have got through to the court. Yes, yes, thank you. Thank you. I, I don't think there's anything else that arises on the bundles unless the right. court has anything. Thank you very much. Lady, we appeal with the permission of Lord Justice Mayles, given on the 16th of April of uh, this year, against the decision and order of His Honour Judge Rawlings of the 22nd of October of 2019, dismissing Mr. Charles' claim for damages for personal injuries suffered by him at work at the defendant's quarry on the 4th of September 2014, that decision having been upheld in the first appeal by Mr. Justice Martin Spencer by order of the 5th of October of 2020. <coughs> Bo both the ENT surgeons in the case described the injury as a blast injury. Um, and uh, it was caused when a fellow employee, Mr. Heath, deliberately exploded two air gun pellet targets, which were not work equipment at the site, by striking them with a hammer, which was uh, very close to the ear of the appellant who was bending down to work and unaware of the presence of Mr. Heath. Um, I say immediately, it's difficult to avoid the conclusion that Heath's act was intended at the, uh, at the very least to startle the claim and at the very least in making an explosion to cause him at least some temporary injury uh, as he worked on and around the bandsaw in the site workshop. In fact, the flash and noise were deafening. They caused the claimant disorientating shock. He suffered a perforated eardrum and has permanent damage to his hearing and suffers recurrent ear infections. Those well, matters. There's no issue about the medical evidence, Mr. Huckle. It's Lady, agreed. Understood. It's all. I, I was just about to summarise by saying that's all dealt with in the joint yep. statement. <clears throat> there is no suggestion that Mr. Chow was anything other than an innocent victim here, who had been, as it were, minding his own business, getting on with his job, and doing it well. Well, in this appeal, we clearly, uh, as it were, this is well-travelled uh, territory after two uh, previous hearings, and I, we understand that. And you have the findings of fact made by His Honour Judge Absolutely, Rawlings Milady. in paragraphs in particular 23 to 29. Absolutely, Milady. And, and the appeal is limited. You have a uh, appeal on four grounds. Milady, we do. I was about to say, we, we have to identify, of course, where the judges below went wrong. Um, I will, uh, would, with uh, the court's permission, concentrate on uh, the trial judge's decision. Uh, in this appeal, I will identify what I say are 10 major errors in His Honour Judge Rawlings's judgment, and I will try to use my oral submission to concentrate upon those. Yes. Lady, I can hear a present. I can too. Ah. There we are. Sorry. <laughs> in relation to the first appeal, we simply say that um, the High Court judge uh, failed to intervene where it was appropriate for an appellate court to do so. Um, we say the test for this court is precisely the same as, as met him. Um, and where we identify major errors on the part of the trial judge, it follows that we say that it was a failure, uh, that the failure to intervene was in each case likewise a major error of the first appeal court. But beyond that, oh, I should say, there are specific complaints about some of the findings of the findings or views of the first appeal court in our skeleton at paragraphs 32 to 35. I don't address those now, but we do say that they are where the previous uh, judge uh, went wrong in part. You mean um, Spencer J? Yes. Mm -hmm. Mr. Yeah. But the heart of this appeal is as to where the trial judge went wrong uh, and why that decision should be overturned. Lady, I only say, uh, finally, on, on that point, <coughs> In amongst the um, agreed bundle of authorities is the Bellman case. Just for the court's reference, um, it's at um, uh, authorities bundle, page 44, and at paragraphs 14 to 16. And the only point I make about it is that, firstly, Mr Justice Martin Spencer queried what the nature of the appeal was as to whether the decision uh, to impose vicarious liability was a discretionary matter 
uh, based upon the balance of all factors. But it's clear from the decision of Lady Justice Asplin uh, in uh, Bellman um, that the um, decision is a matter of law and therefore, on the facts, uh, a matter of law and therefore this court is at liberty in, 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 even to more, more extent than it would be otherwise to intervene, if I put it that way. That was a very poor way of putting it, but I think the lady will understand what I mean. This is not the situation of an appellate court being constrained in relation to interfering with a decision on the facts. We are not in that so far as the question of a vicarious liability in particular is concerned. Um, sorry, I'm, I'm sure the court is mine. I'm not sure I quite understand that last part. Yes, very inelegantly um, expressed. No, I'm, I'm sorry. sure it's me, Mr. Hunt. On, only, I'm, my, per, my point is only that this is a reviewable decision because, well, firstly, because there is little dispute about the findings of fact made by the judge. So we are, to all intents and purposes, on agreed facts in any event. And therefore, what is an issue is the application of the legal principles to those facts. And therefore, that is uh, preeminently, as it were, a matter of law that this court is enjoined to review. Thank you. Lady, as far as the grounds are concerned, as you have mentioned, Lord Justice Mayles gave permission on all the grounds advanced, although, if I may put it this way, he was... Yes, but he was... All I was about to say was he was particularly interested, if that's the right word, in the vicarious liability appeal and its interrelationship with what he called a direct claim, that is, the employer's liability claim, um, at law for a failure, as we contend, to take all reasonable steps to provide for the claim of safe place of work, safe systems of work, and safe staff of colleagues. That's the Mr. Huckle, my apologies for interrupting, but the decision of Lord Justice Mayles is that he granted it on four grounds, direct duty, breach, vicarious liability, and causation. M Lady, that's absolutely right. Yeah. And all I was saying was, I think, <laughs> I think it, was, it was framed as <coughs> all the grounds advanced uh, in the permission order. But um, we're, we're not, there's no dispute between us at no, all. No, the order that. actually reads, permission to appeal is granted as to grounds A, direct duty, B, breach, F, vicarious liability, and H, causation A. Yes, the, the, the commentary from Lord Justice Mayles um, says that uh, he was uh, particularly concerned, if I can put it that way, about the vicarious liability yes, aspect, yes. but that he would grant um, permission on all the grounds because of the interrelationship between the direct duty issue and the... Well, on liability. the four grounds. He yeah. identified, yes. Lady, there's, there's absolutely no reason. I, I'm not but taking it any It sounds issue. as though you're suggesting there are some other grounds. No, no, no not so at why all. Why are we even talking about it? Well, lady, it's, 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 it's my fault for not being clear about it, but, I, but we are agreed. Um, I, I should say that in relation to uh, the EL claim, also in play are the management and workplace regulations pleaded. We accept, as the, as the judge said, that the Enterprise and Regulatory Reform Act of 2013 means that those such such duties are now circumscribed, as it were, by a duty of care and negligence, but that, as he also said, um, the breach of regulatory requirements will be strong evidence, I should put it quite this way, but we say strong evidence of failure to follow accepted practice and hence of negligence and give rise, if you like, to a rebuttable presumption of negligence. That may be not quite a little bit too far, but they, they are still important matters. Now, lady, the, the case has, the, therefore, these two, as it were, separate aspects, the vicarious liability aspect and the employer's liability aspect. It is important, we say, to address both aspects. Uh, both are based in uh, different ways on specific questions of uh, justice, of imposing liability on the employer for the acts of someone not authorised uh, by it to act in, this, in that way. And we do say, and this is at the root of our submissions, that it is gravely unjust on the specific facts of this case for the appellant to, as it were, fall between the two stools of employer's liability on the one hand and by case liability on the other in not being entitled to claim against his employer. Uh, Lord Justice Mayle said uh, that the grounds relating to the question of EL duty are closely related to the VL issue and we respectfully agree. <coughs> Although they are interdependent though, the basis of fixing liability is separately analysed and to be separately analysed. 
and the element, but the element of independence is not offensive, if I can put it that way. Um, just again, without taking you there for the court's note, Lord Justice Irwin addressed this point in the appeal court in the Morrison's 2 case. If the court will allow me, I'll call it Morrison's 2 because as you, we will know there are two Morrison's cases and the latter is called Various Claimants Against Morrison's, which I find a rather um, clumsy name. So I call it Morrison's 2 unless the court would like not to. Um, the observations of Justice Irwin in this point in the Court of Appeal were cited in the Levitt case, which you do have, uh, for uh, the Court's note at Authorities Bundle 188, paragraph 54. I just mentioned that because my proposition is that um, one can be liable both directly and in vicarious liability as an employer. And that was Lord Justice Irwin's proposition. Um, as far as the EL claim is concerned, this was never a, an also ran argument as contended in the respondent's skeleton. But the appellant was, and I think it's right to make this point now, at trial seriously hamstrung in making the uh, EL claim um, by what we call the woeful disclosure and lack of evidence as to the employer's systems and policies that was available to the court all matters within the employer's control, evidentially. That's a topic on which you don't have permission to appeal. Lady, I'm not going to press it. Um, <laughs> There's nothing to press you. I haven't got permission. No, well, Lord, quite right. You've got two lines, vicarious liability and employer's liability. Yes. Milady, I was going to say, my little friend, um, Mr. De Barry, has set out in great detail uh, in his uh, skeleton for this appeal the, the relevant documents and evidence as adduced and found by the judge, uh, the findings made by the judge, and the arguments in favour of the judgment, in favour of judgment for the claimant. And I don't seek, obviously, to revisit the detail of those. And likewise, the. Um, Judgment of Mr. Justice Martin Spencer records the submissions made uh, to him and Ori in the first appeal at paragraphs 22 to 28. I, I say in general terms, we maintain all of those arguments, insofar as we are permitted to, um, and say they should have succeeded. But I know that the court will have seen all of that, and uh, I will not try here to repeat them. Lady, with the court's permission, I, I want to address the employer's liability aspect first. Right. And I do say, I should say, uh, I've already said, I think, I'm going to um, direct the court's attention to what we say are a number of uh, major errors in the judgment, in the, in the trial judgment. Uh, and the first of them is, the, is this. Because we say that the employer's liability aspect provides the basis, in fact, for consideration, proper consideration, of the close connection test for vicarious liability. Uh, the obligations of the employer in the employer's liability provide the context for consideration of whether vicarious liability should be imposed. That is uh, how it was originally opened to His Honour Judge Rawlings, and again, the court will find that at Supplemental Bundle 266, if you want to see it. Um, and so I do say this is the first of the major errors that the judge fell into. Um, and it was an error repeated on appeal at paragraph 33 of the first appeal judgment. So just to be clear, what is the error that, that the judge didn't regard the employer's liability claim as providing context? Yes, okay. he addressed them as it were separately. completely separately. Okay. Lady, can I then um, turn to, um, on the, in relation to the employer's liability aspect, uh, the uh, evidence? Uh, and firstly say, as I've already said, that Malone Friend, Malone Jr. dealt with the evidence in the skeleton. The claim is set out, of course, in the particulars of claim, which you have at the end of the core bundle at page 130, 
in particular for these purposes, paragraphs 5, 7, 8 and 10. Can I just ask, are you seeking to go behind the findings of fact made by Judge Rawlings? Um, in general terms, no, my lady. So why do we need to do anything other than look at his findings of fact? Um, there are, if I may, uh, 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 some submissions I will make about uh, inferences that he drew, which we say were not properly open to him to make. But in general terms, the basic facts are not in any way in dispute. Also, when you're raising the point of inferences, the inferences have been raised in your skeleton argument. The issue of inferences was also raised in the grounds of appeal, and you don't have permission on the inference point. Now, they may be different inferences, but I just want to put down that mark in there. M lady, and, and um, lady, um, lady Justice uh, Simler has already made that point, and, I, and I'm not going to try to, uh, to go against it, of course. <coughs> <coughs> Uh, but Malia, could I then draw the court's attention um, to the general uh, position on the evidence? Um, so no evidence actually was called or adduced by the defendant at all about the incident. Um, the first piece of evidence that I'd like the court to have it clearly in mind is that of Fiona King. Now this is uh, recited in part in the judgment um, of uh, Mr. Justice Martin Spencer. But could I take you straight to it, please? It's in the supplemental bundle. Two places, actually, but it's, it's uh, indexed uh, for supplemental bundle 328, right at the end. <coughs> I think it's right at the end. So there are two statements here which I'll draw the court's attention to. They've been canvassed before, but please, if I may. So in Miss King's statement, you remember the situation that the defendant served these two statements late. There was a, an objection made to them being relied upon, but at the trial, they were before the court because the defendant indicated that it would not call them, although both witnesses were at court. and. Um, then my junior saw that there was important material even within the statements that had been served, and therefore he put them in as he was entitled to do under the rules. So uh, the judge made the observation about what weight would be attached to them, of course, but um, I, I invite the court's consideration of what they say on their, on their face. And in this case, Miss King, who was um, a uh, human relations manager uh, for the defendant um, who began working in 2016, so after the uh, incident itself, but nevertheless she was a human relations manager for the defendant and it's obvious from the statement that she had taken advice from others, um, but at paragraph 7 to, uh, to 10 she sets out the relevant pieces of information we say. <clears throat> and most important of these is at paragraph, perhaps, is at paragraph 8, where she says, had a complaint for concern been raised, it would have been investigated. Both Roll Tech and Tarmac supervisors would have been spoken to. If even a vague concern or complaint was raised, human relations would have sought further detail and fully investigated the matter. Any investigation documents would be kept in hard copy and would be on the file of those involved. If there was an issue on site, Tarmac would have acted and would not let the is issue escalate further. And then, had a complaint or concern been raised regarding raising tensions at the site, a thorough investigation would have taken place and Tarmac's bullying and harassment policy would have been followed. So, it's clear from that statement that had the complaint at whatever level that was undoubtedly made, or the concern that was undoubtedly raised in this case, being relayed to HR, then the defendant employer would not have done nothing as actually happened, or didn't happen. Um, 
Now, both the trial judge and the, and the uh, previous appeal judge seem to have been exercised by the finding that the claimant's concerns had not been as grave as he had suggested in evidence. But to Miss King, on the face of her statement, this was irrelevant. And if I may respectfully suggest that so the court may think for very good reason, without the investigation as to what was happening, the extent of risks of escalation could not be identified and could not be dealt with. I, I also point out in this context that Mr. Gain, who was the role tech supervisor, so the claimant's own supervisor, if you like, although acting for these purposes as part of the overall structure um, of management for the defendant, um, whose evidence the trial judge expressly accepted, including in preference on some points to that of the claimant himself, um, gave the view, at, it's at Supplemental Bundle 295, that he, having received the report and passed it on to Mr. Grimley, who you may remember is the manager, the operations uh, chief, I think, or section operations manager of the tarmac, who didn't give evidence. Um, he having passed that information on, it was then for tarmac to sort it out. He doesn't specify by doing what. But it's significant in our submission that he obviously felt it was sufficiently serious, A, to take it up with tarmac's direct management, Mr. Grimley, and that there should have been some form of action following it. Now, Ms. King's evidence is also significant in relation to the findings of the trial judge. And I, I, I note, or, or give the note, uh, it's at Core Bundle 112, para 27 of the judge's judgment, where, where the judge appears to find it significant that Heath was not specifically implicated, as it were, by the claimant or his, the appellant or his brother. But it's obvious, is it not, that Ms. King's proposed investigation would have revealed more detail about what was going on and who was involved. And if I can put it this way, it wasn't for the employer, or for the court for that matter, to blame the victim for not giving enough information when raising a concern which is a difficult enough thing for an employee to do at the best of times. So then also uh, in the supplemental bundle, um, at supplemental pages 222, two, two, is the statement of Mr. Jones. I think I may be taking you to a different section of the bundle. I've got core 331, but I, I, it may be that it's supplemental 331 at the end again of the bundle, Mr. Jones's statement. Um, I just checked that. It's the same statement. It's, it appears yeah, twice. It's the same it statement. appears twice. It, both of them appear twice. But it, perhaps it's, for consistency's sake, I'll use the ones at the back of the bundle. Um, so 331, you have Mr. Jones's statement, or at least paragraph 11 of it, um, which confirms. Uh, what I suggest is clear from Ms. King's um, evidence. Let me just make sure I've got that right. Not aware of any significant concerns, but if there had been, they would have investigated. Yes, I mean, he, he puts it, of course, as had there been any serious or significant tensions, and, I, and, or, and or if any complaints had been made, Tarmac would have investigated this. So in my submission, do objectively, that supports the evidence that we rely upon from and always rely upon from Ms. King. Now, I would say also that on the evidence of Ms. King, there was no doubt in her mind that this was a potential bullying or harassment issue. Also, there's no doubt there should have been a record made. Sorry. I'm sorry. What makes you say that in Miss, we don't know what's in Miss King's mind. She didn't say what was in her mind, um, nor did she give evidence. Lady, what she said was, though, that they would have applied the bullying harassment policy. Well, had a complaint or concern been raised, yes. a thorough investigation would have taken place and the bullying and harassment policy would have been in place. Yes. But we, we don't know what, what sort of... 
that's going to come absolutely to right. But yeah. all I'm all I'm suggesting is that in her mind, when giving the statement, was the potential applicability of the right. bullying harassment policy. The whole thing, if I can put it this way, falls at the first offence because the investigation simply never took place. I was going on to say that no doubt, there's no doubt either from her statement that there should have been a record made of a concern or complaint. But certainly none was made or kept or provided. And Whilst we have Mr. Jones's statement available there, um, could I also refer you, and uh, it's convenient to do so, at paragraph 14 on supplemental bundle, page 331. Referred to in part in the judgment, um, Mr. Jones speaks to a previously demonstrated need of which the defendants of the respondents management were aware generally to keep Mr. Heath himself and a super, as I would put it, under supervision and control, and implies more than that that it was quite possible to do so. He describes that in relation to Mr. Heather's ordinary day to day management. Is this paragraph 15 you're referring uh, to? Sorry, I, I had in mind 40, but it may be that it's gone well, on. Well, he's <coughs> talking at 14, he's commenting on the atmosphere at the site. You're, I'm sorry, my lady, you're quite right, it's paragraph 15, my note was in error. Just part of everyday management of a typical workforce. That's the bit. Excuse me. That I was just referring to. And he said whatever behaviour there was, it was unrelated to contractors being on site. Yes, yes. I'm not. My, my point is a more general one that Mr. Heath was someone who was known to require day to day management in this way, and the inferences had responded to it, if I can put it that way. Oh, you are saying paragraph 15 is the basis for saying he was someone who was known to require day-to-day -day management. Is that putting it a bit high? Well, it, it, how can I put it? it? Specific reference to Mr. Heath, who in the past had not been the easiest of workers to work with and had required um, to be put in his place. And my submission is that it's, it, the proper inference from that is that it, it had been possible to do so. Um, he was, of course, the subject of a particular matter in the summer of 2014. Look, that had nothing to do with it. No, no. I, I, I was about to say, leaving that aside, this is a more general point that Mr Jones was making. But I mean, this could, this, we don't know what this is about. This could have been that he was rude. He. Yes, yes. My lady, I want to make it clear. I'm not relying upon this in relation to the breach of duty aspect. It becomes relevant in consideration potentially of causation. Because if you remember, the judge said, effectively, that Mr. Heath was someone who wouldn't accept instructions. So that's the, only, that's the, the, the piece of evidence. So I'm identifying it while we're there as relevant to that point. Sorry, I should have made that clear. So my second major error of the judge is that we say he failed correctly to analyse, understand, and act upon this evidence and its true purport, um, which was provided by the defendant, came from the defendant, and in our submission is to be taken at face value. Yes, it, are, it raises questions, but it also gives important information. Are That's you referring now both to the evidence of Mr. King I am, and Ms. Mr. Jones? I was about to clarify, Ms. King and Mr. Jones. And so the position is their statements were before the court, untested. That's true, Millie. The Mr. Justice Martin Spencer said about it um, at paragraph 38 of his judgment, I take on board the point made by Mr. DeBerry arising from the evidence of Ms. King that what she says would have happened can be translated into what should have happened. And that is the way I put it. I take the um, court's clear indication of the restrictions on what I may make submissions about, and, and I, I move to
to this point. In terms of inference, I am not pressing the adverse inference point for the reasons advanced to me. But what I would say is that the judge's assessment overall, we say, was very generous to the respondent and drew inferences which were favourable to the defendant that were wholly unwarranted on the evidence and involved him in just the sort of speculation which he elsewhere purported to reject. And I am now referring to the judgment at core bundle pages 1, 2, 2 to 4. And can I identify the particular matters? I'll take uh, 122, uh, yes, it starts with breach of duty. And um, I want to refer to, firstly, paragraph 76. 76 is on 123. It is, Melody, thank you. Now, in this paragraph, the judge finds that taking certain action against Mr. Heath would have been difficult contractually for the defendant. We say, in the absence of a detailed history from the defendant about that uh, relationship, this is, as it were, pure speculation and amounts to an inference in the defendant's favour. At paragraph 74F, the judge also inferred that Starr and Heath made their way to the workshop to carry out the prank as he found it to be, a practical joke as he found it to be. But the truth is there was no evidence before the court on where they should have been or what they were supposed to be doing. It, in some ways, maybe favorable to my case, uh, certainly on vicarious liability, that, uh, that they were acting in concert. The finding was they were acting in concert. But I do point out that there was little evidence from which that inference probably be drawn, or no evidence we would say. And then I've already adverted to this by reference to Mr. Jones's statement, but at paragraph 72C of the judgment, the judge concluded, or appeared to conclude, that Heath would not have obeyed the rules, even if made aware of them. We say there was no evidence for that finding, and the evidence, such as it was available, was to the contrary, from particularly Mr. Jones. Um, paragraph 75, I'm very Sorry, mindful. What, why do you say it was contradicted by what Mr. Jones said? I thought you were relying on what Mr. Jones said about Heath being not the easiest person to work with and having repeatedly to say things to him, put him in his place. Milady, that's right. My, that's my point is that the evidence of Mr. Jones um, implies that uh, Heath was capable of being given instruction and obeying it. Why? Where? Where does, where does that come from? Well, maybe, <laughs> ultimately, if an employee is not capable of, of accepting instruction, then they probably don't remain an employee, if I put it that way. So all I was saying was that Mr. Jones's evidence is the effect that he dealt with Heath, put him in his place, gave him instruction, and I say that that implies that that was successful in general terms. I, I can't take it any higher than okay. that, put it any higher, and I appreciate it. These are just new, you can't draw any inference, can you? And John, Mr. Jones says one thing, and the judge drew an inference based on the evidence he heard. I'm not sure you can say that, that John Jones contradicts what's said at 72C. Well, Lady, I suppose my base point is that we say there was no evidence upon which the judge could properly have concluded that Heath would not have obeyed instruction, which he had purported to do. Okay. Well, <clears throat> I thought the judge set out why he said that, because Mr. Heath committed a clocking offence which obviously was against the rules, and he thought he could get away with it. That's true. That's true. Well, that's, that's, that's the basis he, for the judge's finding. He, he does say that. The Lord, I suppose, he does identify that piece of evidence. But um, on the other hand, the result of that, event, that incident, that incident, was that uh, Heath was suspended mm -hmm. and then allowed back to work subsequently. So what? Well... What I say is that this does not 
provides a bit proper basis for a finding that he could not, uh, would not obey rules at all, as it were. He, an instance that he hadn't obeyed rules, more than one instance that he hadn't obeyed rules, um, nevertheless, does not uh, imply, in our respectful submission, that this was an employee who could not be controlled. Um, That's not what the judge said. He just said if, even if he'd had some education around horseplay, that, that there could be no confidence he'd obey the rule, given the clocking events that my Lord's just drawn your attention to. Yes, my lady, I understand the way your leadership puts it to me. What I would say is that it's, if you like, a conclusion of doom about instruction and education, because um, the whole point about instruction and education and supervision and, and so on in the workplace, surely, is that... Um, one makes the attempt uh, without assuming that it simply won't be um, uh, complied with. So again, I, I can't take it any further. I say, uh, and I, I maintain, that the evidence such as it was did not justify the judge's positive finding that Heath would not have complied with instruction. Maybe I go on to um, what I think will be the fourth major error for which we contend. Sorry, then, which is three? That last point, was it? <coughs> well, there are the three aspects in which you say the judge was over generous to the respondent. Yes. Mm -hmm. I'm so sorry, I didn't identify Paragraph 76, 74F, and 72C. Right. Yeah. Okay, so this is number four. Uh, the, the, actually, the third, if I just formulate it, the third major error, I, I thought I'd said this, I apologize if I didn't, well, was that. Um, uh, he simply didn't properly reflect the evidence that he had and, and as my lord says, then made uh, findings that the evidence did not support that reflection. So it's a combination of those two. Well, you've given us three examples of where the evidence you say did not support I have. the finding made by the judge. I have. That's, that's the major error. Melee, that, that's right. Uh, it's, it's right that I do so, although as I think I said at the beginning, uh, the basis of this appeal is heavily on the basis that the, the judge applied the law incorrectly to the yes. facts as he found. As I think I understood. Lady, yes, do forgive me. No, it's I, all right. I have realised that um, actually I won't have the 10 I mentioned because I did think, and it's my error, that the permission was broader uh, than I'm, I'm, I'm being informed it was. So um, some of the, a couple of the points, I think, were related to the question of adverse inferences, which clearly I do not press. I will renum <coughs> I'll renumber them as best I can as we go and then t and totally it up. Tell me about the numbering. Just here's <laughs> the next point. Yeah. Thank you very much. So, the next point um, is that we say that the, um, there were findings on the evidence which the judge should have made but did not. Uh, firstly, uh, he made no specific finding about what was the purpose of what Heath did, beyond saying that it was a practical joke. Um, at Mr. Chell's expense. And the way I put this is, it's very unclear, we would respectfully submit, that if the judge, as he did, rejected the idea that this was about, quote, lightening the mood, close quote, it's very unclear what the purpose of the so-called practical joke could then be. And I put it in this way, if it was neither intended as a, a laugh, if you like, as a joke, properly so-called, or, on the other hand, as an act of harassment or bullying or intimidation. The finding itself, you will find at paragraph 17 of the judgment at core bundle 111,
if you have that, the judge said, no direct evidence, any finding involves an element of speculation. Cross examined Mr. Chell, accepted that these, that these actions were likely to be a joke which went wrong. Um, I'm satisfied that these actions are likely to have been aimed, as he suggested, to the tarmac uh, investigation or at lightening the mood. In my judgment, it was a joke, but it was a joke at Mr. Chell's expense, and I'm satisfied it was connected with the tensions between tarmac and big tech, that is, in the sense that those tensions were a desire on the part of Mr. Heath and Mr. Starr, who, as Mr. Chell says, wanted to watch Mr. Heath doing what he, doing what he did and laughed about it after to play a practical joke on Mr. Chell. So does it explain what's wrong with that finding? Well, Milady, it begs the question of what are, the, what are the possibilities as to why this action took place? But why, why do you need other possibilities? The judge has made a perfectly sensible, common sense finding that this was a practical joke connected with the tensions, uh, but went wrong Well, it, at Mr. Chell's expense. Milady, the, the way I put that is this, that um, one should interrogate what is meant by a practical joke and what it represents in, right. in context. What, what, what's the basis for that submission? Um, well, the, the basis for the submission uh, will be in due course uh, that um, it, it is a uh, quite obviously a deliberate act planned and done in consort with Mr. Starr. Uh, which, on any view of it, could only, as I said at the outset, have been calculated to at least startle and likely uh, injure in some way, even if only temporarily. Um, the judge found expressly that it was not done with the intention of causing injury. He says that at 70... Um, uh, 63D... Lady, I he, have found Mr. He did. did not intend to cause injury to Mr. Chell. Lady, he did, but we say that on the evidence there was no proper basis to make that positive finding. That's what I'm. Um, that's what I was getting to. With this. But, um, my, but my real point here in this section is to identify as the fourth major error failed. Uh, uh, failure to make findings that should have been made on the evidence. And the one here is that the finding that should have been made is that on any view of it, this action was an act of bullying or harassment. It was not a joke. It could not properly have been called a joke of any kind. And once the judge had found that it wasn't about lightening the mood, then the use of the word joke is entirely diff is entirely un un difficult to accept. I'm, I'm really sorry. I, I'm not sure I quite get this. Um, if um, my son, who has a somewhat warped sense of humour, um, stands in a doorway in our house, and as I walk past, jumps out and shouts at me. Um, he thinks he's being funny and he's playing a practical joke. Um, the consequence of it might be that I fall over and bang my head. But all he's doing is playing a practical joke. Why, why was it wrong for the judge in this case to find that the man who thought it would be a laugh to set off a, a pellet gun thing you know, close to somebody to give them a a shock and make them jump. Why, why is that any more than a joke? Well, Lord, firstly, the finding that it was not about lightening the mood in our submission removes the idea that he was doing it for a laugh. Why? I mean, because they, well... Lightening the mood means, in some way, helping things. Mm. That was what the judge was saying. This wasn't, this wasn't helping things. This, this was a, a stupid practical joke meant to shock. Lord, I take, I take your Lordship's point, but I... I, I reaffirm my point that I do not accept that my submission is that the two are inconsistent. The idea that it was in any way humorous or lightening the mood was rejected by the judge, rightly so, and that leaves... But, but um, sorry, it, the judge found it was a practical joke. He, he did, he used so that you word. You can't say words. he rejected that it was humorous. 
Well, he didn't actually at all, at all suggest that it was humorous. Well, the practical joke was the, the individual thought it was humorous. Um, well, m m lady, not according to the quotation from Mark Twain that, um, that Mr. Justice Martin Spencer started his judgment <coughs> with. Yeah, well, we're dealing at the moment with Judge Rawlings. My lord, I, my lady, I, I accept that, of course. Well, I mean, could, could I mean, Mr. Heathmort at the point. Can I make the other point, uh, my lord, to your lordship's perfectly proper point to me? And it's that context is everything. And that whereas your son could properly be seen as, even misguidedly, doing something out of humour in that situation, the context here was, a, was an existing trade dispute of some kind, uh, human, uh, human resources dispute. And, and that, is the, that is the major difference here. And the judge made that specific linkage between the tensions about that and, and this act. Well, that, in, our, in our respectful submission, that changes the complexion of it completely. And for example, in another case, and there are other cases like this, one can have evidence that X is a practical joker. He's known to do stuff like this, if you like, which could go wrong and cause injury. Um, obviously, anything could go wrong and cause injury. But um, there's, there's nothing of that type in this case. And in my submission, the, the context of the background dispute is what should inform the proper views taken of what was going on. Um, as I said, in our submission, it's clear and obvious, and I think my Lord formulated partly in this way, it's clear and obvious that, upon the balance of probabilities at least, that his act was intended at the very least to startle the claimant, um, the appellant, and at the very least in making a, a form of explosion uh, to cause him some, albeit temporary injury, however you phrase what the effect might be at a lower level. Um, when he was, the claimant, the appellant, working in the workshop on and around the bandsaw. And you may have seen reference in the investigation materials in the case uh, to the suggestion that startling, causing someone to be startled in that environment is a very dangerous thing, which doesn't take much persuasion. So, but that's Mr. Wilson's report at Supplemental Bundle 215 for the note. Uh, dangerous and highly likely to cause injury in the context of using machinery such as band saws. And the general point, because after all I'm dealing with the employer's liability aspect here, is that it was precisely the sort of act that an employer properly considering a concern raised about tensions or friction in a workplace between workers would or should anticipate. Again, Mr. K Ms. we say Ms. King's evidence supports that and, and really supports no alternative view. So just to be clear, that the employer should have anticipated that, he, that employees would uh, undertake practical jokes intended to startle and to cause at least some injury. Milady, I think to put it in that way is asking too much, or even the reasonable employer. So but the point I, is the employer should... I'm asking you what you ask. Yeah, the employer should anticipate that there could be problems of indeterminate nature and confrontations of indeterminate nature. So the employer should anticipate problems of indeterminate nature. Oh, well, perhaps... Yeah, yeah. It, it, well, I just want to write down what no, I understand. you say the employer Can I formulate it as, as, I, as I best I would? Yeah. Um, the, uh, the employer should anticipate that there could that the tensions could escalate. And this was Miss King's evidence. Tensions could escalate in a in a way which would be unpredictable as to with any precision, but which could or would give rise to the risk of injury. Where do we find that in Ms. King's witness statement? Um, it, it, it's only the. Oh, sorry, let me just um, go back to Ms. King's statement. Page 328. Thank you very much. Paragraph 9 on 329. If there was an issue on site, Tarmac would have acted and would not let the issue escalate further. Paragraph 10, 
had a complaint or a concern being, or a concern being raised regarding uh, raising tensions, a thorough investigation would have taken place and Tarmac's bullying and harassment policy would have been followed. Paragraph 8, if even a vague concern or complaint was raised, HR would have sought further detail and fully investigated the matter and kept record. Um, just to mention briefly, I mentioned it earlier, but the report of Mr. Wilson, who carried out the independent accident investigation, is at Supplemental 215. May I resist the temptation to take you there, unless you want me to, but I just wanted to point out that he used the word malicious in his conclusions. I'm not suggesting that the judge was bound to accept that. Well, of course he wasn't. He wasn't, no. I, 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 that's, what, that's the point I'm making, really. But he did not, i put it this way, just didn't deal with it and reject it, as it were. So, and he also never used the word humorous. Lady, really, that's all I want to say about the facts. Because apart from that, and they're set out in some detail in our scale and argument, as, as well as in the judgments, of course, um, the, the facts are essentially uncontested or, or agreed. So can I? So, so we, you, <coughs> the judge should have found, and you dealt with this issue about <coughs> the purpose of what Mr. Heath did. That's that's the one thing you're relying on, there, is it? Yes. What? Well, yes. Yes. Okay. And and, and that, that that was, if, if you like, in general terms, um, Lord, foreseeable, uh, and and or foreseeable as a potential risk which required the actions that we've talked about, <coughs> the investigation and so on, that Ms. King refers to. Yes, but I, you. You're, you're saying that he should have made a finding of fact as to what Mr. Heath's purpose was. Uh, a, a, a finding of fact other than the one he did make. Yes, which... Yes, all right. As you understand, I'd say is equivocal in the sense... Yes, all right. Talk to okay, right. So, can I address the legal issues? And um, I think it'll now be my fifth major error identifying in the judgment, which is at paragraph 67, 68... Um, of the judgment, call 122, I think. One, two, one. And it, this is the uh, essential um, point of the judge's approach that he found that the um, employer's duty to act in this case only arose when there was a foreseeable risk or threat of physical violence. Now, he phrases it elsewhere as risk of injury, but he, c he concentrates on the risk or threat of physical violence. Is that right? Well, or does no, he go on. No, you can go on. <laughs> <laughs> well, he, he spells it out in 66. In my judgment, the correct test is a reasonably foreseeable risk of injury. Yeah. yeah. That's, I believe that's right. But then if you look at the particulars given in 68, he concentrates on the threat of, or risk of threat of violence. But that is providing the basis of why he said there wasn't a reasonably foreseeable risk of injury. Well, lady, I take that point, but lady, I do say the judge's approach was wrong. And, uh, and, and in this respect, I do draw the court's attention to this focus on the question of risk or threat of physical violence. There are, there are, if I may, just to make the points I want to make about it, there are a number of points to make about it. Um, firstly, it's very much not correct in general, and specifically on the evidence of Ms. King. Um, she, what isn't? 
What is incurred? That what was required was a, a risk or threat of physical violence, um, or for that matter, specifically of injury. But that's, I, I appreciate that in, in duty of care terms, there has to be a foreseeable risk of injury. Yeah. Yes. I accept, I accept that, of course. But so so just, just formulate for us what the major error was at paragraph 66 to 68. The focusing on the threat of, of uh, physical violence. The judge makes this point a number of times in his judgment. Um, he says, for example, earlier on in the judgment of 23 to 24, there was no express or implied threat of violence. Uh, I submit that read, read overall, the judge is approaching it on that basis, that, 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 that the employer needed to foresee that this tension was going to escalate into a, a, some form of fight or physical confrontation, physical violence. And we say that's far too narrow, particularly, if I may say so, as in this case, nothing of the kind happened. There was no physical violence. Um, there was injury, and there was, I suppose one could argue, I suppose, in a way, that the inflicting of high levels of noise in the form of a physical assault, but do you understand what I mean? It's not the sort of incident that the judge is talking about. So there's a total mismatch in our respectful submission between the duty of an employer to avoid this sort of um, injury occurring, as we would contend for it, and uh, the judge's approach to what was needed to be foreseeable. May I put it in this way? Um, well, firstly, Mulroney Jr. In, in, the, in the appeal skeleton and in the previous one, I think, said that there was, in this case, an opportunity to, to review the question of what horseplay or practical joke means. And I've mentioned the quote from Mark Twain that it was best if not who Spencer made. But I would put it in this way. It may not be necessary for the determination of this appeal, but we say that when one considers the development, or the legal developments in the last, say, 20 years, um, in both health and safety field and its complementary employment law field, the, the old approach, if you like, that, uh, that horseplay or practical jokes are out with the obligation of the employer to control what happens in the workplace um, is, or at least is potentially, out of date. Um, because the starting point really is that the employer owes a direct duty of care a duty to take all reasonable steps to guard against um, foreseeable risk of injury at work, from danger of various kinds at work. So and in this, so just sorry, just pausing there, you've got here a situation of tension. Yeah. That doesn't give rise to a foreseeable risk of injury. Well, lady, we would say it does. The mere fact of tension. Well, because without investigation to identify what the extent of the tension is. Well, this is tension between, as I understand it, directly employed and agency employed staff. That it's the sort of thing that happens in workplaces, just as there might be tension about pay being uh, not, not equal as between different groups of employees. Are you saying in any situation where tension exists between one group of workers and another, um, without any other suggestion, mere tension gives rise to a, to a foreseeable risk of injury? Lady, I would put it this way, that where an employee, and in particular a fitter, an experienced fitter, as Mr. Chow was, and so was his brother, on a quarry site, um, feels the need to draw the tension to the attention of management, then that, aside from the abstract general question that you posed to me, that 
does give rise or should give rise to a foreseeable risk of escalation to include potentially uh, harm. Injury. Injury. The injury can take many forms. So, of so in any workforce where an employ a worker raises the, the existence of tensions between one group of workers and another, uh, the employer is on notice and has a, a, and a, a um, has a duty to take reasonable steps to avoid a risk of injury. Arising. Which, in the first instance, as Ms King's evidence says, would involve proper investigation of the concern. Of course, that investigation might reveal that there was nothing more that needed to be, to be done. It might reveal all sorts of things. The point is, at the very, at the, in the very, the very least, the first step needed to be um, taken. It, it is, in my respect of vision, asking too much to suggest that the employer should foresee even the type of injury which is actually sustained. Well, that's not part of the test. You don't have to foresee it see the type of injury, Precisely. it's foreseeing injury. But you say there is a foreseeable risk of injury once there is tension drawn to the attention of management. Once there's tension sufficient to make an employee of this type, certainly, of these types, to raise it as a concern, say they felt uncomfortable, there's a report that they've been told by the other set of fitters to leak, get off site, those sorts of fac factors. But that evidence wasn't accepted. Um, that, that evidence wasn't not accepted, my lady. I think the bit you're referring to is what the judge didn't accept was um, that whether that Mr. Chell and his brother asked to be removed from site. That's right. So, but there, but there is evidence which I'll find for you. I don't have it immediately to hand. Um, well, it's 20, 20 and 21, satisfied that they talked about general tension. Yeah. Uh, there was a fear on the part of the one group of fitters that they might be replaced by the others and that they were being made to look bad. Fear about their jobs. Friction did not include express or implied threats of violence. No. That's the finding at 23. I, 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 and at 24, Mr. Gain was clear. Neither told him that any friction involved threats of violence or any danger. Maybe that's right. But, but um, Milady, as you know, it's my, it's my submission that that's, that's not the end of the matter, that um, there was an obligation of the employer to take action, and that we say that that is what Ms. Uh, King's evidence supports. And there was n no evidence to the contrary, actually, upon which the judge could properly conclude that there was no need for the employer to take action, and there was no foreseeability. Also Lady. relevant is, are the findings at 26. I am not satisfied that Mr. Chell and Gavin asked to be taken off site. Yes, really, I uh, mentioned that. Yeah. Lady, can I bring it back then um, to the nature of the duty of care? Uh, another aspect of it, of course, and this. This becomes important in both this context and in the vicarious liability aspect, which I want to get onto, of course, is, um, is that the employee is under the control, that is Mr. Chow now, is under the control within the terms of his terms and conditions of employment of the employer. And just to uh, take it away from this case and the facts of this case for a moment, um, the employee, she must be at work as directed or she will not be paid cannot feed herself or her family, as it were. Um, and except in extreme cases, she can't simply avoid a generalized threat uh, by leaving. So all she can do is actually report it to her supervisor. And that is precisely what happened uh, in this case. There's a vulnerability there, which also, we say, engages the uh, duty of care of the employer. And also, whilst talking a bit broadly about it, the modern workplace is expected, uh, we would submit, to be a protective, safe, supportive, non-discriminatory environment. And the employer has a general duty of care to take all reasonable steps to make it so. And so very rarely can an employer properly leave it as a matter, as it were, leave it as a matter of uh, between employees. And 
Now, as to the risk of injury, well, injury, as we know, can take myriad forms. It can be physical, it could be uh, mental. Bullying typically, uh, well, it can be both, but typically in stress type cases, doesn't give rise necessarily to physical injury. So, all of these matters are in play in determining what the employer should have done consistent with uh, its duty of care, duties of care. And then, finally on this point, I think, um, I've already mentioned the statutory requirements in Regulations 3 and 4, both of which are pleaded, both of which are referred to specifically in the judgment, although not addressed in any detail. Really, this brings me to a matter of difficulty for the advocate, because as your leadership knows, we made an application before the appeal to uh, expand or amend our um, skeleton argument. And I don't seek to go behind that, uh, that refusal of that application, but in this court, of all courts, the law accuracy about the law and its requirements is um, uppermost. And regulations three and four, I invite uh, the court to look at them. We can provide them if you'd like, uh, but they are they are the law, or they're part of the law in this case. And uh, as far as Regulation 3 is concerned, it's very familiar. It's the duty to risk assess. A suitable risk assessment must be undertaken. The um, suitability is in health and safety terms, not just physical safety, by the way, health terms. And it must be reviewed uh, under Regulation 3, 3 shall be reviewed by the employer if there is reason to suspect that it is no longer valid or there's been a su significant change in matters to which it relates. So you, you'll understand the importance of that potentially about new information available to an employer which arises in this case. And then the point of it is to undertake risk assessment um, with a view to take appropriate preventive measures to prevent harm. And Regulation 4 uh, refers to Schedule 1 to the regulations, which applies the general principles of the prevention, which include the obvious, avoiding risks, evaluating risks that can't be avoided, combating risks of source, and then this, uh, adapting the work to the individual, especially as regards the design of the workplaces, the choice of work equipment, the choice of working and productive met methods, with a view in particular to alleviating monotonous work and work at a predetermined work rate, and to reducing their effect on health. I only mention that because, you know, it's nothing about dangerous machinery or uh, uh, in itself. Uh, it's to do with monotony, which can itself give rise to problems not necessarily of a physical injury type. And then finally, and perhaps most importantly, Schedule 1 also specifically refers to this as a principle of prevention, preventative and protective measures, developing a coherent overall prevention policy which covers technology, organisation of work, working conditions, social relationships, and the influence of factors relating to the working environment. Milady, it said in the respondent's skeleton argument that it was far-fetched of us to suggest that a risk assessment should take into account the risk of horseplay and the like. We say it's not far-fetched at all, that the risk assessment is to be comprehensive of the potential risks in the workplace and is to be reviewed according to information as it develops. In this case, there is one risk assessment only that has been provided, and it relates to a band saw only. There's reference generally, and including in the judgments, to the rules, but the rules are not a risk assessment. The rules are, are a document that one might imagine would develop from a risk assessment. So we say there is no relevant risk assessment to cover workplace relations, supervision, control, instruction, and so on. 
and the risks to be apprehended are extremely broad. So what do you say should have been in a suitable risk assessment? Well, the general risk assessment should have encompassed all the matters that I've just adverted to from Schedule 1. But in the particular, on the particular facts of this case, a revised risk assessment would have, and, and revision of risk assessments can be a relatively informal process, of course, and has to be flexible and, and dynamic in the workplace, one understands that, but it certainly would have encompassed the report of tensions between different groups of workers in the workplace. And then what would have been the result? Well, we say, as we always said, the result would have been, or ought to have been, an investigation, instruction. In this case, Melody, you remember, um, <coughs> Mr. Jones, I think it is, also says that there was no need for Mr. Heath and his colleagues to be afraid for their jobs. And what we say about that is, that could have been explained to them. And there's no reason to suspect that if explained to them in a proper way, as well as instruction to leave um, other workers alone, <laughs> Um, it ought to have removed the risk of this event happening. M Milady, I'm sure the court's well aware of this, but risk assessment, I can't put it too high, risk assessment. Risk assessment has been described as the blueprint for action. I think that was Lady Justice Smith originally adopted with some if uh, gusto by the Supreme Court. And the important background is that since 1992, since the six-pack regulations, as they certainly used to be called, the obligation of the employer is no longer to be considered reactive, or only reactive, of course it has to be reactive, but it is to be proactive. It's for the employer to assess carefully the risks which may arise and act to minimise or review or avoid or minimise them. It's a different world, therefore, from that in which the original horseplay cases were decided. I'm in danger of spilling over into the vicarious liability aspect. I don't want well, to do you're going to have to because you've got two hours. Lady, I understand. I just want to finish these submissions about EL and then I'll yeah. move on. Um, I would add this, the evidence of Fiona King implies, we would say, that somewhere in Tarmac, there was a risk assessment which covered the sorts of problems that we're talking about in this case. And I say that for this reason. A bullying or harassment policy, one might infer, comes out of, or should come out of, a risk assessment. Not necessarily. I agree, my lady, not necessarily. But certainly, if one was covering, if one was um, drafting a risk assessment, then the answer to the problem of potential bullying and harassment well, set out the wrong way round. would be the policy. Well, with respect, it's not the wrong way around. Well, if, if uh, there may be no risk assessment, but nonetheless a bullying and harassment policy yes. is, um, is established, in order to discharge duties under the Equality Act. That's certainly true, my lady. But in this context, from a, an employment, health and safety point of view, um, a risk assessment has to, we, we respectfully submit, a risk assessment has to take account of those sorts of risks in a general risk assessment. Well, I'm not sure I agree with you. I don't think uh, you need to establish a risk of bullying and harassment in a workforce before you produce a bullying and harassment policy for that workforce. Milady, we may be at cross purposes. I think my, my point is that starting from scratch, as it no, were. Your point was King's evidence implies there is somewhere hidden yeah. in the bowels of tarmac Absolutely. a risk assessment. Absolutely. And I'm saying to you, I can't see that anywhere in her statement. Right. The mere existence of a bullying and harassment policy does not suggest that, to my mind. Because to have a bullying and harassment policy, there is no need to have a risk of bullying established. Milady, that's absolutely right. And all I was saying was that if one starts at scratch from an employer's liability point of view, that I say the risk assessment should encompass all kinds of risks in the workplace, which will include... I understand that, but 
I'm challenging your point that Ms. King's evidence implies there is a risk assessment somewhere. It doesn't. Um, I, 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 I'm sorry. I, I see the point that your leadership is making. I, I can't take it any further than to suggest somebody at some point just thought about the risks associated with bullying and harassment. Yes. Whether one formulates that as a risk assessment or not is, I suppose, entirely open to question. Yes. But I suppose my real point is that the, risk, the, out, the outset risk assessment should encompass those sorts of risks. Maybe, and yes, therefore, maybe, yes. the answer to the risk posed in the assessment would be, we have a bullying and harassment policy which will be applied. Maybe. I appreciate that in different contexts that sort of policy is required for different purposes. But in my submission, it arises here too. <clears throat> um, a few, few final points on this. Firstly, even worse as it were, the judge appeared to want specific risk or to look for a specific risk to the claimant from Heath. And I, you find this in paragraph 67 of the judgment. Um, and if you like, therefore, jumps to a, the specific risk to be apprehended as opposed to general risk. And our submission it did not require, um, for the duty to be engaged, did not require specific awareness of, of a risk from Heath. 67 is what Mr. DeBerry said, not what the judge said. Judge is summarising oh, Mr. So DeBerry's submissions. No, no, uh, sorry, is, is your leadership at page 67 or paragraph? No, paragraph 67. Sorry, I'm on, that's... sorry, my, uh, I apologise. It should be core 122, paragraph 6, but my notice is core 122, paragraph 67. Yes. Can I just right. check that? It's on page 121, paragraph 67 sorry, one, is one, two, a one. summary of Mr. DeBerry's submission. Yes, I'm sorry, I've got that reference wrong, but um, I will correct it in due course. I don't want to um, spend time trying to find that now. It's my, my apology. Um, ah, 68, though. Not a reasonably foreseeable risk of an injury from a deliberate act on the part of Mr. Heath, and then he says, or any, uh, or any uh, tarmac employee. But I, I'm, I'm reasonably confident there's another reference to risk from Mr. Heath. I'm making uh, the general point, I suppose, or the point that it's wrong to go from to become too specific about the risks to be apprehended, especially when there isn't, or we haven't seen, a risk assessment at all. And this is a general, we say this is a general problem, and the, and the sixth, I think, major error with the judgment and the judge's approach on this aspect, uh, that uh, he wrongly focused on the incident and the risk of it rather than what we call a systemic duty to avoid risks arising in the workplace and including risks from the tension that had been reported. And if I could just ask you to look at paragraph 71 of the judgment, which, just to check, is on, is on 122. For all of these reasons, and I hope it's clear, we say that the assertion, the, the finding, as it were, of paragraph 71, that horseplay, ill discipline, and malice are not matters I'd expect to be included within a risk assessment, that that is wrong as a matter of law. And we can see it from Schedule 1, which includes social relationships. There was, as I've said, no general assessment of general risks in this case. But we have seen. Forgive me, Milady, I'm trying to go rush through the points in my notes, which are rather long. Can I make reference to the specific finding of the judge that the tension had, tension had eased or reduced prior to the incident? Um, I submit that doesn't help the respondent. And the reason it doesn't help the respondent is because it's obvious that it hadn't, in any real sense, or any relevant sense, because the incident happened. And secondly, I would point you to this, it's a bit tangential, I appreciate, but in amongst the investigation material is the statement from Mr. Starr, which you will find at Supplemental 202. 
And may, may I summarise it in this way? He wanted to talk about the background. He said something about, well, there's been lots of discussions about you um, wanting to get rid of us. This is star for the tarmac fitters, if you like, the in-house tarmac fitters. Mr. Evans, who was conducting the statement, stopped him talking about that and said, no, no, we just want to talk, we're just talking about the incident. But my point is that it was still very much in Mr. Starr's mind as what this was at least in part about. Um, and so neither of those bits of evidence, in our respectful submission, supports the suggestion that the easing of tension was significant. And then final sub-point is none of the measures suggested as required by the appellant would involve any cost to the respondent. And in no proper sense could it be said that they would cover, they would involve any inconvenience. As Mr. Jones said, it would be just part of everyday management to stop, put a stop to these tensions, stop them escalating control the situation. And therefore, when we get to it, as it were, there's no real balance to be made in terms of standard of duty. And so, to summarise, we say it's a substantial error of the judge to posit a requirement of a foreseeable threat of force or violence in order to give rise to the duty. Um, if you like, in another sense, this is not a Caparo situation. There's no question uh, of uh, an alleging a novel form of duty where the court has to consider whether it's fair, just, and reasonable to impose, impose it, for example. There was some misthinking about that until the Supreme Court dealt with it in Robinson, I seem to remember. But the point is, this is a well-established, clear duty of care reposing in and imposed on the employer to act, to assess and act. So for those reasons, it's straightforward employer's liability, the duty to take all reasonable steps to avert hazard or risk of injury to employees generally or the claimant specifically, and here it was, in fact, both. <coughs> and and I, I do say it's difficult to see why it's not obvious that tensions or friction in the workforce, particularly a workforce working with dangerous landscape and equipment, compromises uh, the safety of the workplace and everybody working in it, or potentially compromises it. The employer doesn't need to envisage precisely how injury to individuals may be caused. Uh, and we do say, I keep repeating it, Ms. King's statement doesn't really allow on, on the evidence for an alternative view. Milady, can I then... Um, I had some points about supervision as a separate matter, but I don't think I want to pursue those. That would have been my seventh major error, so I'll leave that. I go to a seventh major error uh, on the causation aspect. I think I probably already dealt with this, actually. Um, we say that on the evidence available, the proper evidence available from Mr. Jones in particular, um, uh, and again, by implication from Ms. King's evidence, there was no reason to conclude, no basis, no proper basis to conclude that had Heath been properly supervised and instructed, particularly about the lack of any threat to the jobs of um, the tarmac fitters, that he would not have positively responded or at least not engaged in this activity. There was certainly no evidence positively to assert that he would. And as I think I termed it earlier, it's the prophecy of doom, rather, to say that, oh, it's a waste of time to instruct or supervise employees who have shown a tendency to dis disobey. A note also from Mr. Jones's statement, again, just for the note, is paragraph 12, at that last statement in the bundle, supplementary bundle, but he notes that 
uh, first he heard about this incident was when Heath contacted him. So he, Heath was, if I put it this way, I know it can't take it very far, but he was certainly concerned enough about his position, if I can put it that way, <coughs> to actually get in touch with Mr. Jones to discuss it. That is a very small point I extend. And then finally, finally on this aspect, in any event, we say, um, His Honour Judge Rawlings is finding that even if, uh, even if uh, uh, Heath had been, as it were, apprehended before, before the event and instructed accordingly, he wouldn't have obeyed. Um, that doesn't help the respondent either in our respectful submission because if, if the reality here was that Heath was so uncontrollable that he could not be made safe to work in the workplace, then it was or would have been a breach of the employer's duty to Mr. Child to allow him to be there. The four safes, I've already mentioned three of them, from the famous Wilson and Clyde Coal Fame Company case, uh, include safe place of work, safe staff of colleagues, as well as safe systems and equipment. So I'm afraid in our submission, it's to no avail as far as breach of duty is concerned. Lady, I have 35 minutes to deal with vicarious liability, in the first instance anyway. So uh, can I run through it as quickly as I can? Firstly. In this case, no causation issue arises, because obviously the employer, if vicariously liable, is put in the position of the perpetrator, who clearly caused the injury. At a very basic level, um, Heath was employed as a fitter, and that employment included hitting things in the workshop with a hammer, which was part of the work equipment provided to him. So that if you like, in the old salmon formation, formulation of, uh, of vicarious liability, this incident could be seen as him undertaking an un unauthorised mode of an authorised activity. Heath was, and the judge did not uh, demur from this, authorised to be in the workshop, and he was clearly authorised to use hammers. And there is a sense in which the concentration on what he hit has clouded that basic fact. It, it, it was something that um, Mr. Justice Martin Spencer noted, actually, at paragraph 59 uh, of uh, his judgment. But a pellet wasn't part of his... No, no, no that's not right. It wasn't, he wasn't furthering the job he was authorised to do in any sense. Yeah, well, uh, that's true. It really. formed no part of the work equipment that he was authorised to use. The, pa the pellet target itself didn't, no. no. But of course, well, let me give you a different example. A fitter takes a hammer and he hits any piece of metal. Forget the target, and some of the metal you know, um, flies off into the eye of, of, a, of a colleague. Um, that's not a difference of kind, I would respectfully submit, although, of course, the bringing in of the pellet target does, um, is an additional aggravating factor. If you like. Um, but in terms of, I, I, was, I was only starting with a basic point that was one that was taken by uh, um, uh, Mr. Justice Martin Spencer. Um, and indeed, in the permission that Lord Justice Mayles gave us, uh, he obviously thought this was of significance too, because the, the, ter the wording he used was, the injury was caused by a practical joke played on one employee by another at work using an item of work equipment. The hammer, that is, obviously, as a, res as a result of work-related tensions. It was not the result of any personal vendetta. So, if I may put it this way, it moves me on to the next point, which is the, that the incident is described as is one of horseplay or practical joke doesn't tell us whether or not there's a close connection of the type required in the authority. Moreover, of, as your ladyship will be aware, it's no answer to a claim of vicarious liability that it's not what the employee was employed to do. I think that was the point just being made to me. Of course, the question of furtherance of the employee, employer's business is a relevant consideration, but in, it plays no part in this case. We do not say that Heath was 
furthering the employer's business. This is a friction okay. case. There are two questions, though. The first is, what was he authorised to do? And yep. you seemed to be saying he was authorised to do what he did. He but, but the real question here is, how closely connected what he did was with what he was authorised to do? That was really my question. I, I, lady, I don't disagree with that. But, but I would say this. He was authorised to use hammers in the workshop, in the workplace. So with, to that extent, he was doing what he was authorised to do. The, going further and doing something with the hammer that was not intended to further the furtherance of the, work, of, the, of the employer's business, of course, is a, is a separate matter. But my point was going to be, and is, that it's a common feature, of course, of vicarious liability cases, um, you know, such as uh, Mohammed and, and, and Morrison's too, that the, uh, that the employee is not doing the employer's business and is only doing something which is calculated to damage the employer's business. And that applies to Mohammed itself. Beating up people on the petrol forecourt is not conducive to the ongoing business of, the, of that garage. Anyway, um, but my point really here is that uh, no presumptions apply, if you like. It's an open question of closeness of connection to the work. And, and the way I would put it is it's better to consider, I'm going to come to the authorities, but can I just make these general remarks? It's, it's better to consider whether there is, in a real sense, a random act for, person or for personal reasons which truly could have occurred whether or not the employee and the, and the perpetrator were employed together in the same workplace, or for that matter, outside the same workplace, in the same workforce, perhaps. So that, if you like, it is not just to expect the employer to be responsible, uh, partly because it's not just to expect the employer to exert control over such random matters. Um, and, and I say, I've already mentioned Mohammoud, and we'll come to it briefly, but one might say the attack upon Mr. Mohammoud and the petrol station was pretty random. Um, but there was certainly nothing random about Mr. Heath's attack on this appellant. It was planned and pursued in consort with Starr. The judge found specifically that Heath was with, it, with Starr, and if you remember, I cited it earlier, laughed about it immediately afterwards. He still thought it was funny. Apparently. So we say that a good proxy of the close connection test is, was it about the work in any way? Um, or in contrast, was the workplace a mere location without any significant connection, without any close connection? And I make these submissions. If it's about the work, it's not personal vendetta. If it's about the work, it's not the employee on a frolic of his own. It's very difficult to characterize what Heath did here as a frolic of his own. He was, in our respect, was pretty clearly pursuing a labor dispute or an HR dispute, albeit in a wholly unacceptable way. Thirdly, if it's about the work, it is within the scope of employment, to use that expression, which must cover all matters relating to the work. And if, on those bases, you say it is related to the work, it's connected to the work. So the bar for, and, and closely connected to the work, the bar, the bar for close connection in our respective mission should not be set too high in the case of an employee victim because of the, and, and it's a factor, it's a different liability aspect, but it's a factor because of the employer's overarching duty to guard for the employee's safety. So that interrelationship comes in here, we say. And I, I say immediately that different considerations apply to the major cases that we now have on my case liability, the most major, um, Mohammed and Morrison's, um, one going one way and one going the other, of course. But in both cases, the victims were external to the organization. So that this factor, which we say is important, was not in play in either case. And so we, we say this case is more akin to the sexual abuse cases, if you like, the, the Lister Catholic Brothers, because part of the features of those cases are that the employer 
owed a direct duty of care was in fact in loco parentis or very sim similar situation uh, to the victim and therefore owed a direct duty of care for the safety of the victim. I appreciate that in uh, um, in those cases there was al also the aspect of conferral of authority over the victim. I, I appreciate that is an additional point in those cases but nevertheless um, there is correspondence we say I accept, of course, this is, there's no abuse of power issue in this case. And so we say, for that reason, just harking back to a point I made earlier, we say that the uh, traditional, uh, and I would submit to some extent at least outdated, approach to horseplay and, it, and what it connotes for these purposes is anomalous in light of the developing law from the sexual abuse cases and now generalized, if I can put it that way, uh, in the latest Supreme Court cases. And I know this court decides the case before it, but we'd, we would invite the court to spell that out, because the old ideas that horse plays okay and that the employer is not responsible for it don't fit, in our respective submission, well with the modern environment. But I leave that, because that's a general point for your leadership. So again, there's no dispute that there was a background of tension friction in the workforce about changing workforce arrangements, uh, and that the appellant and Heath uh, were very much involved in that, and the judge so found. Uh, and we would say that nothing could be more integral to the business of the employer than those issues. When you look at the authorities about friction, they're framed in terms of whether friction was inherent in the action, in the work of the, in the business of the employer. But that's because it, in those cases it arose, for example, the rugby players, I think it was rugby players, um, working violence upon each other. Um, th that's the context for the way that was framed, in particular in the Graham case, for example, which I'll come to. But in our submission, there's no reason to look at it in that narrow way. We say that the, the friction tensions, tensions friction in this case, are integral to the business of the employer. And it's that which founds the proper conclusion of close connection. <coughs> the judge, of course, found the causative, if you like, connection or connective link between those tensions and the incident. And without, I hope, um, descending too much into jury advocacy, um, how can it properly be said that there was no uh, close connection therefore if there was a close connection between the tension and the work and the employer's business how can it properly be said that there was no close connection between what came directly from that tension in this incident where's the break if you so absent those tensions, you would accept this was not a case of a sufficiently close connection? Uh, absolutely, Milady, because it's then it would be in the category of randomness, I think. And, um, and so I get, I get this is two stages, I suppose, if you like. If the tension itself was closely connected to the, um, to the, to the work, then what came from it is closely connected to the work, necessarily. One follows the other. And in our respect for submission, again, jury point, but would the person on the Clapham or any other omnibus seriously doubt the close connection of both the tensions friction and what came, came from it with the employee Heath's work? And I said before, this threat was sufficient to make a quarry fitter and his fitter brother report to their supervisor and hence to the manager, Mr. Grimley. So lady, that brings me then to the cases, and I appreciate these are cases which have been traversed for many days, um, and I'm not, I don't have the time to do that. But I, I will, uh, if I may, point, point you to where we say the answer to this case is. In the skeleton, Miller Jr. set out relevant passages from Mohammed and Morris's two, and I don't seek to go back o over that. Um, we rely on the cases of Graham 
and its reliance on the Canadian case of Basley. And this is dealt with in the ske our skeleton at Corbundle, page 26, paragraphs 38 to 41. I note, so that there's no doubt about it, um, Justice McLaughlin was one of a, of a court, a unanimous court, gave a judgment to a unanimous court of seven in the Basley case. Um, she went on the following year to become the very distinguished Chief Justice of Canada for 17 years. In case the, the nomination Justice McLaughlin was seen to be some lower level, it's not by any means. And indeed we know Basley was effectively adopted as a basis for the law of vicarious liability uh, in Lister and uh, the Dubai case, and uh, has been mentioned elsewhere, including in Mohammed itself. So I, I feel on fairly uh, solid ground referring to Basley and relying upon it. And you will find um, in the judgment of um, Ms. Uh, I don't know whether it's Mrs. Justice, um, uh, Justice McLaughlin, um, an exposition of the whole basis, basis or bases of vicarious liability, which was then uh, uh, adopted, if you like, in the Graham case. Now, uh, I'm trying to think if I can shorten this as best I can, but I note that there doesn't seem to be much dispute between us in this appeal about this, because in the respondent's skeleton, um, Lister is described as the wellspring of the modern law of vicarious liability and it, as founded upon Basley. So we seem to be seeing it from, at least to that extent, from the uh, same hymn sheet. Well, well, Lord uh, Stain gave it a Graham. He did. Did and, uh, we have that, uh, m'lady, uh, for, for your ladyship's note at uh, bundle, Authorities Bundle 215. Um, find Lord Steen at 215, uh, Lord Clyde at 219. Um, Lord Millet at 2.30. And can I, I will take this very shortly if I may, because I know that you have to consider those cases in detail anyway. Firstly, I've already made the point, we're in a friction case, not a furtherance of the employment, employer's business case. In Basley, and you'll find this at Authorities Bundle 15, uh, para 22 of that decision, Justice McLaughlin identifies enterprise risk. Sorry, um, so, Basley with me is uh, divided one. Yes, yeah, sorry, I'm at page 22 of the bundle, right. the bundle as a whole. Do you have paginated bundle? Yeah. Paragraph 22 or page? Sorry, uh, page 15, paragraph, paragraph thank you very much. Page 15, yes. paragraph 22. So um, the judge identified enterprise risk as the unifying basis, if you like. That's my words, not her, hers. Uh, but the, the search for a unifying principle, of course, has been a difficult one. But that's the way that she uh, identifies that aspect. And then at, I'm just making notes, if I may, 33 to 34, paragraph 33 to 34, they're quite difficult to follow the paragraph numbers a bit, so they're on the, they're on the side, not with the text. But 33 to 34. She identified the policy considerations, including to invent, incentivize appropriate employer behavior, as well as to compensate the victim for the results of creation of the risk. And you won't be surprised me to say, the creation of the risk here is bringing the two workforces into conflict of some kind with each other. Not a merely having employees in a workplace. Then at paragraphs 35 to 36, um, she makes the point, as we all agree, location and timing are in themselves not determinative and mere coincidental linkage is not derived from the employer's creative uh, creation of risk. So you have to identify a link to the creation of risk. We say that's clear on the facts of this case. And then 39 to 40, um, the, the judge talks about foreseeability of flawed enterprise risk. Then paragraphs 41 and 42 are dealt with expressly in the skeleton, and those are set out uh, there. It's clear that these points, although it was a set, this and Jacobi, the sister case, were both sexual abuse cases, but it's clear that these dicta are not intended to be just about sexual abuse cases and haven't been taken in that way by our senior court. Um, And in fact, I'm, I'm, I have a note here, Lord Justice Longmore, in the Graham case, said, although all this was no doubt 
paragraph 14 of that case said, although all of this would no doubt was said with sex abuse cases primarily in mind, it's a useful general statement of the position and justifies an inquiry into the question whether there is a close connection between the creation or enhancement of a risk and the wrong that accrues therefrom. Um, Graham itself, lady, is at page, oh, I, for these purposes, 169 of the same bundle, para 14. Um, and of course, Mr. Graham lost in that case, so I, I should, should take that on the chin, I suppose. He, he lost um, uh, for reasons you can read. But um, the important point from my point of view is that he lost because it was what happened was analysed as a pure, effectively a pure, random, reckless act. But at paragraph 16, which I think we marked up at 169 F to G, um, the judge said, similarly, there are cases of what one might call normal friction in the workplace, which gets out of hand, as opposed to uncalled for antagonism, which, while occurring in the workplace, originates outside it. Now, it's a matter for the court, but we interpret that as a distinction between the first category, which would justify imposing vicarious liability, and the second category, which would not. In the Graham case itself, there is a very useful review of some of the cases which you have in your bundle as well. Um, in particular, a paragraph 17, uh, which is at one, uh, 169H, the Weddell and Wallbank cases, which re resulted in different results. Um, they were heard together under the name Weddell, which is sometimes a bit confusing, but they're two separate cases. The Wallbank case, the uh, claimant succeeded in the end. And Lord Justice Longmore explains the difference between them. And just to formulate our case back in the terms of this inherence of friction, as I think I've said, I don't, I'm not saying that there was inherent friction in the nature of the work, but in a sense, once the employer has actual notice of the tension friction, um, then that is, in our submission, sufficient to convert that to a, um, a uh, friction or tension which is inherent in the work. If the employer knows all about it, or no, well, doesn't know all about it because it doesn't investigate, but knows about it, is on notice as to it, that should be enough to bring it within that more generally formulated principle in any event. And in, of course, in the Weddell case, just to make the point, there was a spontaneous, sorry, in the Wallbank case, there was a spontaneous reaction to instruction. Oh, I don't claim that that's the case here, of course. It's not that sort of case. Well, uh, as you made clear to the question asked by uh, my lady here to Justice Simler, your reliance is on the tension yeah. and bringing the tension to the notice of the more senior person within the employment structure. Lydia. Um, and just to formulate it in another way which has been used in cases such as the War Bank case, the hostility that flowed from the labour dispute in this case, and I use hostility to include the incident, um, was not a mere pretext for Heath's action. It was both the context for it and the reason for it, and the judge so held. I've already made this point in opening, but the question of the trial judge's evaluative judgment, and of course that is prayed in aid by the respondent, and understandably so, but just in passing, Lord Justice Aikens um, at three, four, uh, uh, authorities bundle 345 uh, in Graham, 
specifically adverted to that point and had no difficulty whatsoever in taking a different view of the proper application of the legal principles to the facts. Sorry, in Graham? Lady, really, have I got that wrong? It's well, I think it's your Justice Longmore, Abigail just... and Lady Justice Sharp. Uh, yeah, I think you're right. So let me just find out what, what I'm talking about there. Uh, <coughs> three, four, five of the authority. Well, it no. is. Sorry? Oh, it's it's the Wallbank case. I'm yeah. sorry. It's the it's the one of the two that succeeded, or reversing the decision of the charter. Twelve minutes I have available. I'll just deal with um, briefly, if I may, with Wilson and Excel dealt with in the Graham case at paragraph eighteen at uh, bundle one seventy C, where Lord Justice Longmore also had a look at that case. Um, you'll find there, firstly, at paragraph thirty two, I think, uh, citing Wilson and Excel. The description of, as it were, being on a frolic, being on a frolic of one's own, as being purely on a private venture unconnected with his work. And then uh, also a citation there from Lord Reed, our Lord Reed, uh, but acting in a different capacity at the time in the Ward case, um, as unrelated and independent talking about an unrelated and independent venture of his own, a personal matter, rather than a matter connected to his authorised duties. These are all just, I'm just picking these references out because they, in our respect for submission, they frame the way the court should approach the question of close connection um, uh, for the purposes of the facts in our case. Um, can I take you very quickly to uh, bundle uh, 353 <coughs> Now you'll see from the black marking on the right hand side that this is a passage um, uh, relied upon by the respondent, I just wanted to point out that the paragraph, paragraph 28, um, ends at the top of page 354, and I invite you to have that in mind as well, whether a particular act falls within the purely personal and independent sphere of life and action which an employee may enjoy. We submit nothing could be further from the facts of this case. And then finally, in this review, the, as part of the judgment in Graham, uh, the Vicu Bien case, which is also before you, is dealt with by Lord Justice Longmore at page 171B, paragraphs 19 to 20. Um, and if I can put it this way, put simply, in that case, <coughs> the cause of the attack, or the motive for it, was nothing to do with the work, but was simply about the personality or identity of the victim, Mr. Rome soft, I think it was, as a foreigner and immigrant. But there was an established history of friction Lady that the was. employer was on notice about. That's true. That doesn't help you, does it? Well, it, in that sense it doesn't help me, but my point is that it was nothing to do with the work. But you said it was the friction, once, it was on, once the employer was on notice of the friction, yeah. that becomes integral to the, to the work. Well, and I, if that were right, Sainsbury's would have been decided in a different way, wouldn't it? Well, not on vicarious liability necessarily. Lady, but maybe, I mean, one of the, uh, the, the tantalizing aspects of that case is it seems to have been run on vicarious liability only, not uh, employer's liability. There might have been a better case on employer's liability in that case. As far as vicarious liability is concerned, whether or not 
um, there's no friction. The friction still has to relate to the work. And in our respectful submission, that in that case, it didn't. In our case, it does. <coughs> and indeed, um, that, that case is, that is made explicit at four, uh, bundle 429, paragraph 37 of the YQBN case itself. I give you the reference. Will you forgive me if I don't take you there for now? But I want to finish off in the next eight minutes. Uh, paragraph 37, page 429. So obviously what I say is that um, this case is in the first group of cases analysed by Lord Justice Longmore, or alternatively, in a group two case, which becomes a group one case, that's the friction about the work um, and inherent in the work, because of the knowledge on the part of the employer of that friction. Either way, it is because the tensions and friction are fairly characterised as incidental to and about the work that vicarious liability should be imposed, we say. Then, I won't take you to this, but you, you, will ha you have in your bundle, and it's only an example, we were joined by, uh, I think, Lord Toulson in uh, Mohammed to look at examples of cases, and I appreciate that it's only an example, but the Levitt case, uh, which you have in the authorities bundle at 173. It's not on all fours with this. A decision of uh, His Honour Judge Friedman sitting as a High Court judge uh, recently, he found for the claimant where there'd been a, not to be too fine a point in it, a, a, a physical confrontation in the workplace arising out of an argument about tools. It's a different uh, situation, but um, has some, certainly some similarities. And uh, I note that permission to appeal was sought in that case and refused. I have already made the point about the direct duty of care being an important factor in the fixing of liability for the actions of a third party, if, a, if Mr Heath was truly a third party at all. Um, <coughs> I would say, in trying to conclude, that the judge reviewed the evidence, but he actually, at least at one point, posed the wrong question for himself. Um, I think this comes back from submissions I was making earlier, but which may reveal why he went wrong in his conclusion, or partly anyway. He formulated it in this way. So I have to ask sorry, myself. Can I just take reference to oh, the sorry, judge's question? Uh, yeah, it's at uh, page 118 of the core bundle, paragraph 55. So I have to ask myself, based upon those facts, was the striking of the pellet target within the field of activities entrusted to Mr Heath by Tarmac? I may be being slightly unfair in the sense that that is certainly a question. I'm not saying it's not a question. Um, but if, if the judge concentrated on that aspect, so if you like the performance of employer's business aspect, then that was in itself an error. Um, the judge accepted in principle that the friction factor, if I can put it that way, can be taken into account, but then rejected that as a basis of finding close connection. And of course, I say that that is the next major error, <coughs> uh, and is the major error of the, uh, of the judge in this context of vicarious liability. Mr. Hacker, bear with me. I just want to understand this. As yeah. to that first question, was yeah. the striking of the pellet target within the field of activities, you say that is a question which the judge could properly ask? He could. But even having said that, my lady, it's too narrow because a, a, a equally a question is, was the use of a hammer in the workshop within the field of activities of Mr. Heath? Which is why I say formulating it in that way may have led the judge to error. And then you said the second, and what sounds like what you say is the more serious error is Oh, no, the, the, error, the major error, I, 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 the error that I'm identifying, the major error for the purpose of vicarious liability is, um, is accepting that the Graham friction factor can be taken into account, but then rejecting it as a basis for finding close connection. So in other words, you should have found that it was a close connection, but that's the specific reason.
And then as a sub-complaint, if you like, can I make this point? And it comes back to the way I opened the case, that paragraph 63D to E of the judgment at core 119, the judge wrongly equated, in effect, we say, his apprehension of the EL duty based on a risk of violence or confrontation with sufficiency of close connection. And that is, although we say there's an interdependency, that is an impermissible interdependency, if you like. They, are, they remain separate bases of liability and to be dealt with as such. And I think that that's specifically dealt with by Justice McLaughlin in paragraph 39 of the Basley case. And although the judge had declined to make a finding as to Keith's intentions or motives because it was speculative, as he put it, um, I, I do say this. He appears to have assumed a lack of intention to cause physical injury. I don't find any evidence directly dealing with that point. That's, that's a, I don't know why that point's in there, maybe. It's, I've just seen it in my notes, but I'll make it anyway. It's not the reason. <coughs> um, but, but assessing the question of close connection uh, by reference to the gravity of the threat is, in our respectful submission, no part of the analysis in Mohammed or Morrison II. Take Mohammed. There was no foreseeable threat that an employee in the petrol station would beat up a customer. There's no evidence in that case to suggest that there was any such threat. So, so the gravity of the threat, I'm not saying it's to be ignored altogether, but it certainly doesn't bear the attention that His Honor Judge Rawlings paid it in this case. And of course, in the sexual abuse cases themselves, there was ex hypothesized that there were no foreseeable threat known to the, um, the person, the employer, similar of abuse taking place. <clears throat> Lord Toulson uh, in Mohammed, actually, i give you this reference paragraph, sorry, authorities bundle 282, paragraph 40, said in this way, said it, put it in this way, the court is not required in each case to conduct a retrospective assessment of the degree to which the employee would have been considered to present a risk. Which I'm willing to accept is better than I could have put it myself. Um, so, such of that, okay, I have five lines, or six lines left, really. <coughs> the submissions recorded at the judgment uh, at Core Bundle 115, paragraph 41, um, by the judge, and refined in the skeleton by my learned friend at, at our skeleton 38 to 9 in the core bundle, paragraphs 40 to 41, but were, we say, and are good, and should have succeeded, and the judge was accordingly wrong in law to reject them on the facts as he found them to be. And in very broad summary, the appellant should recover on the undisputed facts of this case as found. And if he does not, the law is wrong, and we don't think it is. So those are my submissions, unless I can assist with it. Um, I have no problem with you turning your back on the court. Do you just want to check? I certainly will. My junior very kindly says I've said all that can be said. That's very good. <laughs> <laughs> Always reassuring. He can come again. <laughs> I'll just ask one thing. Yes. Um, you, a few minutes ago, uh, complained that the approach to horseplay in the authorities. Um, I've written down anomalous, that may be my word rather than yours, uh, and it doesn't fit with the modern environment, and th this court should spell this out. Um, Graham decided six years ago, isn't that, doesn't that set out the position as you say it should be? Um, well, my lord, I suppose I appreciate the difficulties of me trying to overturn Graham within such a short time, but on the other hand, uh, we do have now, as it were, the final word on vicarious liability in uh, Morrison II, and um, you know, I, I don't know whether that argument was ever made to the court in that case, which but case? in the Graham case, um, but I make it. 
And the Lord, I think, I seem to remember not very long ago, the Court of Appeal, um, what, where it would once said it was bound by previous decisions of the Court of Appeal, Civ Div. I don't think that that's the accepted position anymore. But, my Lord, I, my lady, lady, I'm not, I'm not inviting, I'm not inviting the court to overturn previous authorities. But I, it is right to say, I, I, I hope, that old attitudes to what horseplay is and what it means, practical joke, what it is and what it means in the workplace, um, should be carefully considered. <clears throat> Thank you very much indeed, Mr. Huckle. Um, we'll rise for a few minutes, no more. on the appeal 
as my lady, Lady Justice Davis, observed, and uh, reminders were given, Lord Justice Mail's limited permission to four grounds. Uh, and indeed, the primary ground, so far as Lord Justice Mail's was concerned, was in relation to vicarious liability. Uh, and he made clear that permission was not being given as regards grounds C, D and E, which relate to adverse inferences. Having rehearsed all of that, it may seem perverse to the court that I'm going to outline that the structure of my submissions will be first uh, to go to the facts as found, secondly to deal with direct duty, and thirdly to respond on vicarious liability. Uh, I, I do so uh, because the short but fundamental point, as is trite, is that the burden of proof rested with the claimant at trial, and uh, in a sense all the more so on appeal. And having heard and seen from the claimant himself, as well as other witnesses, including particularly Mr. Gain, his Honour Judge Rawlings rejected numbers of assertions that had been made in the claimant's pleaded case, in his witness statement, and from the witness box. Uh, in turn, it is trite that an appellate court should give due weight to the findings of the trial judge because he has heard and seen the witnesses. In any event, here, uh, the claimant, at some terms, does not appear to actually challenge those findings of fact. I say at some terms because you were told at 10.30 that to all intents and purposes the facts are agreed, uh, but my own friend said at 11.20, that's all I have to say about the facts. Um, so let me begin with the facts because those facts as found necessarily provide the backdrop against which the court will consider the two issues in the case, namely direct duty and vicarious liability. So far as those facts as found are concerned, let me canter through them. My lady alluded to them right at the off, but please allow me to do so. Whereas the work hammer was work equipment, the targets were not. They've been brought into the workplace by either Mr. Heath or someone else. That's at paragraph 13b of the judge's judgment, core bundle 110. Next, neither Mr. Heath nor Mr. Starr were in a supervisory role. That's at paragraph 14, core bundle 110. Then, although both had access to the workshop as part of their role, uh, they had made their way uh, to the workshop in order to carry out this prank on the claimant. And that is found at paragraph 74, little f, for bundle 123. The judge then found that whilst the incident was an ill-judged joke at the claimant's expense, connected with tensions at work between the defendant's employees and Roltec employees. From the perspective of the claimant and his brother, he heard from both, such tensions had eased in the time shortly before the incident. And my ladies, my lord, that's paragraph 18 for bundle 111. Yes, there had been a report to Mr. Gain of attention, but only once. That was found at para 20, or bundle 111. Uh, and that involved, and I'll come on to this shortly, a rejection of part of the claimant's case. And yes, having been reported to Mr. Gain of Roltec, uh, given that it had been raised with him only once, uh, he reported his only once to Mr. Grimley Tarmac. And my ladies, my lord, that's at para 25, uh, core bundle 112. In regard to any friction, the judge found that there were no express or implied threats of violence. That's paragraph 23, core bundle 112. Next, that no request was made by the claimant to be taken off site. 
That's at Four Bundle, 112, paragraph 26. The learned judge also found that in relation to tensions, there was no complaint that made mention of Mr. Heath or indeed any other named individual. That's at Para 27, little a, Four Bundle, 112. The judge also found that Mr. Heath was not suspended for threatening anyone, but as regards a misdemeanor with clocking off, para 28, 113, for which he was properly disciplined, and that was the finding at para 75, four bundle 123. Now, none of these findings which I have gone through, and forgive me for the degree of repetition that that is involved in terms of points already canvassed between bar and bench, none of these findings are in fact uh, challenged, save perhaps at footnote 11, paragraph 17 of uh, Mr. DeBerry's skeleton argument, where it was asserted boldly that on the basis of not sticking to the rules on time recording, uh, it should have been understood that Mr. Heath presented a foreseeable risk of harm to others working alongside him. Now, to trample the ground fully flat, it, it may be necessary, given the ebb and flow of what is said on the appellant's side about the facts, just to get across to the court that I have been able to go through each of those findings of fact and the findings made because of the numerous respects in which, with respect to him, Mr. Chell's account was rejected by this trial judge. He had said that Mr. Heath had threatened another person. That's to be found at paragraph 6, uh, supplementary bundle 109. That's paragraph 6 of the claimant's witness statement. That was rejected, uh, and one finds the rejection of that at paragraph 28 in the judgment, for bundle 113. And the reasoning or the underpinning for that rejection can be found and readily found in the cross-examination by my learned junior of Mr. Chell, notably at page 285 in the supplementary bundle. He had said, Mr. Chell, that he and Mr. Heath used the same workshop. That was found at paragraph 9 uh, of his statement, supplementary bundle 110. That was rejected by the judge at paragraph 14 uh, in his judgment for bundle 110. And the reasoning or the underpinning for that is again readily found in the cross-examination uh, of the claimant, which is at pages 270, 271 of the supplementary bundle. Next, uh, Mr. Chell had said this was a workplace attended on by mounting tensions. And that was the flavour of what was being said at paragraphs 10 and 13 in his statement, supplementary bundle 110. That was rejected by the judge um, at uh, paragraph 18. The court will find that at four bundle 111. And the underpinning, as I put it, is found at the top of page 283, cross-examination by my learned friend in the supplementary bundle, cross-examination of the claimant's brother at 292 in the supplementary bundle, and also uh, the claimant's own post-accident statement, which is in the supplementary bundle at 198, all of which contradicted uh, the assertions made of mounting tensions. It was also said against Mr. Heath that uh, of them all, he was the worst in terms of building up the tension. And that was found at paragraph 11 of the claimant's statement, reference uh, supplementary bundle 110. 
Uh, as the court knows, that was rejected. That's at paragraph 27b and b of the judgment for gondola 112, uh, and uh, readily rejected given what the claimant himself had said um, in the last line of his post-accident statement uh, in the supplementary bundle at 198, where he said that um, he didn't regard Mr. Heath, in fact, uh, as the particular culprit. Uh, it was said by uh, the claimant that um, Heath wanted him off site. That was found at um, paragraph 12 of his statement, supplementary bundle 110, and that was rejected by implication at paragraph 27 of the judgment for bundle 112, uh, and the basis for that. Uh, is found in that last line of the post-accident statement, but also the cross-examination of Mr. Gain, which the court finds at 293 in the supplementary bundle. It was said that there was more than one complaint. That was paragraph 13 of the claimant's statement, supplementary bundle 110. That, as the court knows, was rejected at paragraph 25 of the judgment for bundle 110. Uh, and uh, the basis for that was uh, the cross-examination of Mr. Gain. It was clear that there was no uh, second complaint. Uh, that you will find at Supplementary Bundle 294. And uh, of note also the cross-examination of Mr. Chell's brother at 292. Then it was said by Mr. Chell that he'd spoken to Mr. Brimley. Um, that is found at uh, paragraph 14 of the claimant's statement, supplementary bundle 110, and indeed maintained under cross-examination um, at pages 281, 282 in the supplementary bundle, but rejected by the judge. Uh, paragraph 26 of the judgment for bundle 112 uh, and the basis for that, the underpinning for that is the cross-examination of Mr. Gain notably at 293 of the supplementary bundle uh, where he made clear that he would not have hesitated to take them off site had complaints been made uh, about personal safety um, it was said that the claimant was told that Mr. Heath and uh, Mr. Starr wanted the Chells, both brothers, off-site. Uh, that assertion was made in paragraph 14 of the claimant's statement, supplementary bundle 110. Uh, it was uh, directly, explicitly rejected at paragraph 27 in the judgment. Uh, for bundle 112 uh, and uh, the, the basis for doing that the court will gather readily is because it had already been rejected that Mr Heath was the worst in terms of pension building uh, then the claimant said and for the first time from the witness box that he was in fear for his personal uh, safety that was in cross examination at 278, top of the page in the supplementary bundle, but contradicted by later cross-examination further down that page onto 279. As the court knows, that assertion was rejected by the judge and finds that rejection at paragraph 24 for bundle 112. And uh, the justification for that was, again, that Mr Heath, far from being the worst, was in the claimant's estimation the least of it uh, and the judge not unreasonably noted that such an important assertion for whatever reason had not been advanced in his witness statement uh, and then um, it was said that because the, Mr Chell began to realise through cross-examination the challenges posed to his witness statement by his post-accident statement 
that if it had deficiencies, it's because it was done over a cup of tea. Well, that was rejected by the trial judge um, as implausible, and the court finds that at Core Bundle 113, paragraph 27D of the judgment. So I apologise for bombarding the court with quite so many references, but those are the findings of fact. They are not challenged, or if they are, they are not susceptible to sensible challenge. <coughs> it is, of course, not incumbent um, on a trial judge to address each and every last quibble or submission that is advanced by either party um, and to set out, as it were, every last scintilla of thought as regards the mental processes. But what you have uh, are detailed findings of fact, amply made on all the key points uh, that have um, a reasoning explained for them within the judgment itself but readily confirmed by consideration, cross-examination of the claimant, also his brother, and as I say, Mr. Gaines. So those are um, the key findings of fact. Now, um, having rehearsed them, I'll turn now to direct duty. Uh, as we know, adverse inference doesn't feature in the appeal, but let, let me make this um, um, slightly rhetorical submission that if there's any basis for a adverse inference to be drawn in this case, it is that the presentation of it and the, what are identified as the main arguments have involved over time a relegation of the vicarious liability arguments and an elevation of the direct duty argument. Um, and that may provide some comment on the merits of the vicarious liability arguments. I will be coming to those third and last. But as Mr Justice Martin Spencer said at paragraph 38 of his judgment, and that's at Core Bundle 76. The learned judge's findings in relation to vicarious liability impinge on this aspect, that is direct duty too. If Mr Heath was acting in a way wholly unconnected with his employment, but for his own purposes and on the frolic of, it, of his own, then it is more difficult to argue that the employer should have taken steps to avoid such behaviour. And that is perfectly soundly based reasoning. Now, um, standing back, uh, no case law authority was placed before the trial judge, nor indeed before Mr Justice Martin Spencer, supporting the contention, if that's the one advanced, that intentional wrongdoing ought to be covered in any workplace risk assessment. And certainly at trial, no evidence was adduced on behalf of Mr Chell of any standard or specimen risk assessment that addresses horseplay. Mr, um, uh, Mr Huckle's uh, argument was that the schedule to, I think it was um, Regulation 3, uh, indicates that workplace relationships are fertile ground for risk assessment, which I inference must include the potential for well, on, 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 on an expansive view of that, it's a broad statement, they may do in appropriate circumstances. But, but my submission is that those circumstances, in other words, that first fence was never actually reached given the judge's unchallenged findings. Uh, and the material unchallenged findings that bear on uh, a lady's observation are these. Again, forgive me if there's repetition, but 
let me, as it were, uh, nail home the tax. Firstly, that any bad feelings between the outside contractors from Rolltech and the respondents bidders had eased in the period prior to the accident. Hour 20, four bundle 111. Mr. Chell did not ask to be taken off site. Paragraph 26 of the judgment, four bundle 112. Thirdly, there were no express or implied threats of violent conduct. The finding at paragraph 22, four bundle 112 again. And indeed, there were no complaints about named individuals. And that's the finding at 27, little a, uh, four bundle 112. So the short response, my lady, is there was nothing to put the defendant on notice of the need for a risk assessment, particular to horse trade, or indeed anything more. And my submission is that Judge Rawlins was right when he stated at paragraph 71 of his judgment that horseplay, ill discipline and malice are not matters that one would expect to be included within a risk assessment. That was the, the um, page, uh, paragraph 71, four bundle 122. And, and that, can... that's in a general situation. Yes. If there was something to put you on notice that there was a problem and you would expect it. If there was something, that's why I stress inappropriate yeah. circumstances yeah. And, and the need for notice. But if I can deal with the, the, the general proposition and turn it on its head, if there was merit in what my learned friend has to say about risk assessment being the answer here, it is an answer that seems to have eluded every claimant's counsel and indeed the courts tasked with dealing with horseplay cases. One wouldn't need to strain at seeing whether or not a case can be threaded through the <coughs> vicarious liability needle because you'd simply say, well, where's the risk assessment? Uh, Criticise that and elevate it into a cause of action in itself. And indeed, it, it, it... No, sorry. No, no. You finish the point you're making. But that point is concluded. Is, is this a question of time, my lady? Yeah. I'll stop there for now. Are you sure? Is there course, anything you want course. to finish off on a particular point? No, no, no. I, 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 I'm content there. There is more to say yes. in terms of threat duty, but I hope to be able to say it with, with economy and indeed to finish well before 3.30. So. What you're going to have to address is point made that uh, there was sufficient to at least warrant an investigation as per Ms. King's statement, or you're going to have to deal with Ms. King's statement, whatever weight is to be attached to it, yes, and course. the point she makes about the need for an investigation. Yes. Right, thank you all very much indeed. We'll come back at 2